We'll go right to it now. Here we go. So, yeah, it says Zoom and YouTube are no problem. Uh, let me know when things improve, all right? Meanwhile, brand new song. Uh, this one, it's a, uh, uh, it's tell you, I guess I need to warn you, for the, the folks who are still considering uh, eating a little less meat, this song is going to pinch for you. That one says, let's see here. There we go. My messages are getting in the way here. Yes, it's awesome again. Aha. Um, there's, for folks, we, we in our tradition are, we eat, try to eat harmlessly. Ahimsa is a big deal, harmlessness. So we, I'm a plant-based person, vegan, since 1969, as a matter of fact. So, uh, my, everything I've done in my life has been powered by vegetables, yes. And it, it's funny because there are more meat-eating Buddhists than there are veggie Buddhists, so, interestingly. And occasionally, when, when I gather, uh, gather, my materials to give a talk and I know that I'm going to have a part of the talk is going to have to do with diet uh, I gather quotes and I took all the good quotes Albert Einstein's quote and Bill Clinton's quote and you know all the different uh, famous uh, sound bites about plant based eating that I have gathered I put them all into one song and came out with this. So, my body's not a graveyard for the flesh of living things, not complicit in the slaughter of the stockyard. May I spice my food with generosity. May my table be a blessing for the world. And the beings with fins say, thank you. The beings with feathers say, thank you. The beings with fur say, thank you. Thank you for the gift of life. Simply by not eating them, you're giving them the best life, the best gift. Let's heal our broken hearts with every bite. The billions and billions of creatures killed for food, do we not know that that kind of suffering impacts our well-being? I don't know. Till I extend my compassion to every being, I myself will not find peace of mind. Teaching a child not to step on a snail saves the snail and also saves the child. Don't ask if they can reason, Rene Descartes, but can they feel pain? In suffering, we and they are one. I call animals my neighbors and my friends. With kindness, our broken world can mend. And the beings that fly say, thank you. And the beings that swim, for sure, say, thank you. The beings that crawl say, thank you. Thank you for the gift of life. Let's heal our broken land with every bite. was it who said, uh, if factory farms had walls made of glass, the whole world would be vegetarian. With the slaughterhouses come the battlefields. We order steak and go to war again. Hmm. When I don't eat your brother, my life extends. When you don't kill my neighbor, we discover we are kin. War or peace, check our dinner plate. The same blood runs underneath our skin. And the footless beings say, thank you. The four-footed beings say, thank you. 
many footed being saved. Thank you, thank you for the gift of life. Let's heal our broken world with every bite. All right. Apparently the audio is back, so I'll just uh, leave it at that. Maybe we can give you the whole melody later. But anyway, so every now and then it's important to talk about that. Back to our text. Ho, ho. So what's going on? So, okay, the Buddha said, ready to go. The hall expands, and he announces he's going to talk. So what happens next? If this chapter was a movie, you would see coming in from all directions, north, south, east, west, the intermediates, above and below, bodhisattvas. Uh, bodhisattvas are people who heard the Buddha's sound and said, I want to be like that. I want to learn how to be wise and compassionate like him. And so they're his students. And these bodhisattvas want to hear what the Buddha is going to say because the teachings that he delivers allows them to be better at what they do, which is help us wake up. That's the thing about a bodhisattva is they're already awake. Okay, uh, restarted OBS, that solved the problem, the audio problem. Okay, so it was a question of the, the linking brought the live stream. Okay, so uh, bodhisattvas say, yeah, I want to learn how to help others wake up, get past their pain. And the Buddha says, I'll teach you how. So they're coming. They're coming to attend this teaching from the Buddha. And the sutra that we've been going over uh, gave the name of the bodhisattva coming from which direction the world that he came from, the Buddha who was teaching in that world, and then he shows up and each one of the 10 directions bodhisattvas leaders, following, followed by a huge number of other bodhisattvas, uh, did something similar. They all uh, came in, they made offerings to the Buddha, they uh, each had a, a different style. They sat down in their respective directions around the compass, crossed their legs in full lotus and got ready to listen. That's where we've been. And because this section's kind of long, uh, we've been just reciting it. We haven't been explaining it line by line by line as we usually do. We want to get through scroll one, scroll two, down to scroll three, which is where this long chapter really starts to pick up. So that's the, uh, that's the byplay. That's the outline of where we are right now. And... Uh, Let's look at it. Let's begin. Here we go. They arrived in front of the Buddha, bowed to the Buddha, made a seat, put a special robe on, and crossed their legs in full lotus, and prepared to listen. The sutra says, here we go. Rushang All of those bodhisattvas and their followings from the ten directions were created from the bodhisattva Samantabhadra's practices and vows. With their eyes of pure wisdom, they beheld the Buddhas of the three periods of time. They heard the Buddhas and thus come ones turning the Dharma wheel of the oceans of sutras. They arrived at the other shore of bodhisattva's self-mastery. In every thought, they manifested great spiritual transformations and drew near to Buddhas, thus come ones 
With a single body, they filled up all worlds, and the thus come one's assemblies and bodhimandas in them. Within a single particle of dust, they made appear everywhere all the states of the world and never missed the right moment to teach and transform all beings. Okay. So we've, um, the last word, this is page 59 in our little manuscript here. And for, what was it, like seven or eight pages worth of texts like these, we were watching all the different directions bodhisattvas show up. And one by one by one, they all came in, they all made offerings, made a seat for themselves and their followers, sat down together, got ready to hear the Dharma. So now we're getting to hear something about all 10 directions worth of bodhisattvas. The sutra is describing what, what they're like, who they are. Um, if it was a movie, if it was a video, the camera would be scanning uh, all sides, describing one by one by one, telling us who they are, closing up, closing up on their faces and their, their outfits and their team, the group that came with. Um, interestingly enough, uh, many, many of these, there we go, many of these bodhisattvas come with animals. That's so interesting. Uh, there is, this is the Mahayana. This is our, we're, we're called the Chan school. In Japan, what's that called? Zen, the Zen school. So we're Chinese Zen. No, they are Japanese Chan. So who's keeping track anyway? We're the Mahayana, the great vehicle called. We're the northern tradition of Buddhism. The southern went to Sri Lanka and Thailand. Another direction of Buddhism went to Tibet and Nepal, Mongolia. That's Vajrayana. We're the Mahayana. And what's the difference? Well, one way to classify is the sutras, the, the teachings that the school formed around. This sutra that we're looking at today here in Queensland and translating for China, we're translating for Vietnamese speakers. We have three languages going, English, Chinese, Vietnamese. Um, these are countries where these sutras flourished. We've now got it in English, yes. And we're lucky to be here together in, in uh, southeastern Queensland to be able to find out what's, what did the Buddha say in this language, in this sutra, uh, at that time that we now are trying to bring to life. Our job is to take something that was first spoken 2,500 years ago and see if it can be relevant, if it connects with our world, the 21st century, here uh, in uh, online, you know, we're doing YouTube, we're doing Zoom all at once. And then folks will be tuning in later uh, to watch the archive. So, okay, so does it, does it connect? Is it real? Or is it mm, kind of bizarre, kind of out there? Take a look. These bodhisattvas were created from bodhisattva Samantha Bhadra's practices and vows. Okay, that's the first sentence. That's the key sentence of everything else for a while will follow this. So who is Bodhisattva Samantabhadra? He's somebody we pay a lot of attention to. Let me give you an image so you can see him. Bodhisattva Samantabhadra has an animal that is connected to him. Who is it? It's an elephant. How interesting. Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. Let's bring him, bring this one up. Here he is. When you find him, you find him looking like this. He rides an elephant. Ah, interesting. He has a companion named Manjushri Bodhisattva who rides a lion. But these bodhisattvas today in our sutra text 
say they all came because of Samantabhadra, Bodhisattva. Let's go back a step. There he is. Elephants. Huh. These Bodhisattvas are connected to the natural world. They have, in, uh, if it was Wicca, we would say they have a familiar, right? Sort of, yeah. They have a relationship with the natural world. Look at, here's an elephant. He's got little baby elephants under his feet. Walking together. Okay, what, what's this all about? Well, we can, we'll find out as we go. Um, just to say that here in our teaching, this is the Mahayana tradition, Chinese Chan, you could call it, and this Bodhisattva is central to our tradition. And yet, you can have people in the Chinese Chan tradition, the Mahayana, who don't know anything about Samantabhadra. And they, we talk about four great bodhisattvas in our tradition. One, everybody knows, Guan Yin, bodhisattva. She's compassion, feminine, uh, powerful, uh, has a mantra that is one of the most popular ways of practice, the great compassion mantra. Uh, Guan Yin hears the cries of, of people in trouble, people in distress or beings in distress and extends a hand. Guan Yin Bodhisattva has a thousand hands sometimes in that incarnation. So that's one. There's another one, Earth Store, Earth Treasury Bodhisattva. Oh my goodness. Earth Treasury, known as Earth Store, Dizan Pusa in Chinese, Shri Garba. His thing is vows. He lives in the hells. One of our heroes, one of our, our Mahayana saints, you could say, one of our role models in our tradition, lives in the hells. That's his vows. And he's kind of flame-proof, fire-proof. Uh, he's non-combustible, bodhisattva. More importantly than could his body burn up is his spirit never, never drops. I... In the, the town where I grew up, Toledo, Ohio, there are parts of town where you walk into the, a neighborhood and you feel despair. Uh, especially Toledo used to be a major manufacturing hub. On Fortune 500, Toledo had something like 12 companies that were located of course, everybody had a job, everybody was working, everybody could afford to buy stuff for their kids and make plans for their future. After the globalization, after everything got outsourced outside of the U.S. and we stopped manufacturing, we lost every single one of our Fortune 500 companies, which meant nobody had work. Nobody could plan. I want my babies to grow up and become astronauts, to become CEOs of companies that make contributions, to become scholars, to become wise and good people. It was hard to plan because while well, you couldn't put food on the table. That has a profound impact on people's spirits, and where the spirits are depressed, the neighborhood follows. So my point is, you can physically, well, let's, let's try another one. 60 miles north of Toledo is the city of Detroit, and when the great migration of industrial jobs left Detroit, entire neighborhoods just went to seed. There are places in Detroit that look like they've actually gone back to nature now because people, the banks would foreclose. This is the great uh, stock market crash of the 80s. Banks would foreclose 
and suddenly you couldn't afford to live in your house anymore, people would just pack up and go. And after four years of a house being vacant, houses started to burn. The fire crew, the fire department, simply refused to go try to save the houses because there was no utilities. There was no water coming out of the hydrants. So houses would burn. Folks would come in and strip the copper piping out of the walls of the houses to resell and take the concrete steps leading up to the front door to go sell that because that had some resale value. So here was four walls and a roof, but nothing that could be converted or sold block after block after block of ghost towns abandoned that people bulldozed and then now the forests are coming back. So right within metropolitan Detroit, you have places where you think, gee whiz, the police don't come, there's no more phone service, there's no water, there's no fire, and one house out of 10 has a human being living in it. Hard to live there and keep your hopes up, and this is the human realm. You remember Erstor Bodhisattva we were just talking about? He lives in the hells. What's it like in the hells compared to Detroit? Well, Detroit, there's all kinds of energy now turning, de recycling Detroit, saying, oh, okay, well, this neighborhood went back to, to a garden zone. Let's make it an urban garden. Let's make the most of that former neighborhood, now farmland, and plow it and turn it into places where people can learn how to grow crops and distribute them and sell them because there's no grocery stores available in miles. Let's grow our own food. So <laughs> Detroit has been recycled by creative people, but only because they had no choice. There was no, it wasn't a city in anything other than a incorporation name. Otherwise, it and yet the spirit sustained. Erstor Bodhisattva goes to places where people lose their bodies cruelly, uh, painfully, over and over, and a wind blows them back to life and they, they come back. And So, just to say, that's a hero of the Mahayana, somebody who can be in a situation like that and not lose his chi, not lose his energy. Imagine. Okay, that's two out of four. We got three, two more. One is Manjushri. Manjushri is the bodhisattva of great wisdom. He rides a lion. And uh, there's all kinds of teachings about Manjushri and the blessings that he has and the wonderful energy of great wisdom. And then his partner is this bodhisattva called Samantabhadra. And Samantabhadra, Guanyin, Avalokiteshvara's great compassion, Urstor Bodhisattva's great vows, Manjushri Bodhisattva's great wisdom, and we got this other Bodhisattva great practices called Samantabhadra. Samantabhadra is a Sanskrit word that means what? It means everywhere good. We used to say universally worthy. Mm, you could translate it if you were making it closer to street language. It would be all good Bodhisattva. It's all good. Samanta Bhadra. Samanta means completely, entirely. Bhadra is worthy, good, wholesomeness. So entirely good, Bodhisattva. And great practices, what does that mean? It means that if you have ever uh, had a thought to start investigating mindfulness, Samanta Bhadra can show you how. If you ever had a thought that maybe you wanted to read a the words of the Buddha, pick up a sutra, find out what the Buddha actually said. Samantabhadra has got the book for you and he will help you learn it. Uh, if you ever decided that you wanted to improve your physical health by putting substances, every, every time you sat down at the dinner table, you want to see, let me start that again. Let's recycle that one. If you decided that you wanted to make your diet correspond to your aspirations for well-being for everyone, then Samantabhadra says, here, I'll show you how to cook in a way that you don't lose flavor either. It tastes just as good as it feels to eat harmlessly. 
may my table be a blessing for the world. If, you, if that's your goal, Samantabhadra is right there. So he's got all these different ways of practice to help you accomplish your goals for living in a spiritual way. So any kind of goodness, simply refusing bad habits, removing profanity from your vocabulary, just never letting a four-letter word uh, come out of your mouth into the world. That's, you know, what a wholesome thing. I'm going to talk in a way that enhances people's well-being. That's a noble goal. Giving up a habit like smoking or substances that you're tired of polluting your body with, yeah, Samantabhadra is right there helping you out. So that's, he's the quiet bodhisattva because he's there when you reach for goodness. You say, I'm gonna, I made a, made a decision. You know, getting high got to be boring. And the people, I didn't like talking to people who were stoned. It was boring. Far out, man. You know, my brain went to sleep. And it's, I wanted to wake up. I really did. So I stopped uh, getting high and started looking into what I came with to see what, what I could learn from my own body and mind without substance stuff. So Samantabhadra says, yeah, yeah, good. Let's talk. So that's who this is. And what did it say? Here we go. Back to... It said... All these bodhisattvas and their followings from the ten directions were created from Bodhisattva Samantabhadra's practices and his vows. Yeah. They, by digging into what he offered, these people became bodhisattvas. Then, look what it gives us. It describes them. This is a description, a quick description of these uh, groups sitting around waiting for the Buddha to start the lecture. The eyes of pure wisdom, they saw the Buddhas. They heard the Buddhas teaching, sutras, they arrived at self-mastery. That is to say, their mind never spit out something that took them by surprise and they found themselves doing something that they later regretted because they were, they listened to their own mind long enough that they got on, they caught on to their own habits and learned to move them towards goodness, towards well-being. So self-mastery arose. What else? They were able to transform themselves and get close to Buddhas. Now, here's a strange, this is an avatamsaka state. One body could fill up worlds. And all the assemblies and monasteries or practice centers in them. Here's another avatamsaka state. Within the tiniest thing, a particle of dust, they could make everything appear. So this interpenetration of the small and the great, that's a distinctly avatamsaka state. These bodhisattvas could do that. Time and space for them now are plastic, are under their control. Why? Not because they want to be weird or catch somebody's attention, because they want to teach. And they know exactly when. When to say just the right thing for those living beings who they want to help to go, oh, I never saw it that way before. Hmm, that makes sense. Thank you for explaining that, right? That's what I mean. Okay, ready for more? Let's do another page. Can we do that? Are we all ready for listening to our Chinese? The nice thing about this text here is we've got the Chinese characters, the Hanzi. We've got C beside each one beside each of these characters, these little syllabary. This is called the Goyan Zimu. This is for, uh, in, particularly in Taiwan, but also in the Chinese diaspora. They can make, that's Zhong Un, the sounds. That's Chu Wu, right? But we also have what's called Han Yu Pinyin, which is the ABC. So there's three versions of Chinese. There's the Han Zi, Zhong, there's the syllabary, and then there's the ABCs. So, check it out. Try it. See how Chinese sounds coming out of your mouth. Stretch your, stretch your mind's ear a little bit. Here we go. 
依毛孔中出一切如来说法音声，知一切众生悉皆如幻，知一切佛悉皆如影，知一切诸去受生悉皆如梦，知一切业报如镜中相。知一切诸有生起，如热实验；知一切世界，皆如变化。成就如来实力，无畏，勇猛自在，能狮子吼，深入无尽辩才大海，得一切众生言辞，海诸法智。与虚空法界所行无碍，知一切法无有障碍，一切菩萨神通境界悉以清净，勇猛精进，摧伏魔君，恒以智慧了达三世。Okay, thank you for your patience. If this is all very foreign to you, let's see how the English works. Here we go. Within a single skin pore, they emitted the sounds of all thus come ones speaking the Dharma. They knew that beings are like an illusion. They knew that Buddhas are like a reflection. They knew that the destinies and paths of rebirth are like a dream. They knew that karmic retributions are like a reflection in a mirror. They knew that all of creation is like a summer mirage. They knew that worlds are like changes and transformations. They accomplish the thus come one's ten powers, his fearlessnesses, his courage, his self-mastery, and with a lion's roar, they profoundly entered the great ocean of limitless eloquence. They attained all beings' oceans of words and languages and understood all dharmas. They traveled in space throughout the dharma realm without obstruction. They knew that dharmas are unobstructed. They had been purified in regard to the states of bodhisattva's psychic powers. With courage and vigor, they vanquished and subdued the demon armies. Constantly using wisdom, they understood the three periods of time. Alrighty. So I I just got a comparison. You know what this is like. Who do we have in the West? That could compare to these bodhisattvas. This is what we're hearing: is the camera has pulled back. We got bodhisattvas from ten directions sitting here in each of their directions, waiting for the Buddha to start. Our our lecture, our teaching hasn't even begun yet. We're still in the preamble, the preparation, and the camera is pulling back and saying all these bodhisattvas are A B C D E F G all the way down, listing their qualities. They sound like magicians. They sound like wizards, and if we had anything to compare with it, it would probably be Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, who's kind of a warrior wizard. Gandalf in some of the scenes from Tolkien's trilogy is in there with his sword and with his staff, killing orcs. So Gandalf has distinctly a martial side to him, but he can also, you know, he he has power. He can emit light from his staff when he faces off down in the mines of Moriah with the Balrog, this ancient baddie that shows up, this horrible troll-like creature. So Gandalf is full of transformations, but he's also like.、Uh, In Harry Potter, right? What's the name of the the wizard in Harry Potter? Just went blank. Help! Harry Potter's wizard, not not the see Voldemort's the baddie. It's、uh, not Gandalf, but oh, I just lost it. That's embarrassing. Dumbledore. Thank you, Connie. Got it. Dumbledore. Appreciate that. All of you Potterites. So Dumbledore has what Harry goes up to his his chambers several times. Dumbledore has、uh, all these、uh, devices in his in his 
workshop in his room. Uh, he's got the pen sieve, this thing that's like a, kind of like a bird bath. It's got, it's clear water and you look in it and you drop your thoughts in it and it carries you. You can see the thoughts in the mind. Beautiful, it's uh, J.K. Rowling came up with all these wonderful imaginative things that Gandalf has. He's got a sword, he's got all the, the pictures of all of the past uh, wizards who taught at uh, Hogwarts and all. So, and he's, he's able to, Gandalf's, uh, not Gandalf, but uh, Voldemort, uh, Dumbledore, Dumbledore's best qualities are his ability to teach. He understands people's thoughts. And he, uh, he is a great defender of goodness and, and well-being in a world that is being threatened by great evil, which is manifested in the body of he who shall not be named, right, Voldemort, who wants to, insist, wants to enslave uh, the world. So we do have, and who else? We have in King Arthur, Arthurian legends, we got Merlin. Merlin, uh, his, he was never very well defined in his abilities. So who are wizards? Wizards are, are they human or are they kind of a hybrid human, part human, part angel, part human, part witch, or, you know, whatever it could be. They're, the point is, they have abilities. They have powers that go beyond science's ability to define or measure or categorize. And depending on the quality of the wizard, in Tolkien, we had Saruman as well. They were evil wizards, Sauron and Saruman. So, Wizards can be uh, forces for good or forces for evil. So what's the point of that is here we have a description of what bodhisattvas can do. Were you, were you watching? Look, they could make sounds come out of their skin that speak dharma. And then we have, they knew that. They knew that one, two, three, four, five, six, knowing what? Impermanence. People, beings, are illusory. We come, we live for decades, and we go. Nobody knows after the grave where we go. If only we did, our hearts wouldn't be so broken when a beloved pet leaves us or a relative, right? Buddhas are like a reflection. Huh. So when you see them, now you see it, now you don't. A mirror has reflections. You look in the reflection, you look in the mirror, you're not seeing the object, you're seeing what's reflected. Buddhas appear that way, that's deep. Destinies and paths of rebirth, reborn in the hells, reborn as an animal, reborn as a ghost. It's like a dream. What would this be like? We uh, came over for lunch the other day and uh, some of our, our uh, friends who lived nearby had brought a, another friend who came for the first time, another neighbor, and we were talking about COVID. This time last year, we would not be sitting here with anyone in the Buddha hall. We would have been masked up. We might have been quarantined, right? You remember? And now, where did it go? People are still succumbing. We had a friend of a friend die in Taiwan just this, this week, uh, an elder of COVID complications, didn't recover from what seemed to be a flu, they didn't take it seriously, dead. Still happening, but that worldwide pandemic, gone, where'd it go? It's gone, right? It's like a dream, right? So karma, the things that result from things we do are like reflections in a mirror again. All of creation, look at this image, like a summer mirage. What's a summer mirage? Uh, if you're on a highway heading west in western Queensland, you look down the road and there's this shimmering stuff. It looks like water. Well, it's not. It's heat on blacktop. Summer mirage brought on by heat. Creation is like a summer mirage. So... Everything? Huh. 
Worlds are like changes and transformations. So look at that six in a row of the Buddha's insight describing what bodhisattvas know. Can you live in a world where you see through the surface of things to something else going on inside those things? If so, if that's your ability, that means that when times get hard, when the wind blows and difficulties come your way, can you not be blown off your feet? Can you stand and say, well, this is difficult. I'm going to have to find some strength inside myself to look beyond what's happening in front of my eyes to know that I have had happier days and that there will be happier days ahead, that somehow in this world of duality, pain and pleasure tend to kind of balance themselves out. If you have this wisdom, you can do that. You can stand. You don't have to go down when times get hard or when somebody you're related to, a coworker, a friend, a partner is going through their particular difficulty, can you help them by just saying, look long? After the storm, the sun comes out again. Nothing is permanent, even mountains and oceans shift. So how much the more is this going to pass? This too will pass. If you can do that, if you can help others by borrowing the Buddha's vision and saying, yeah, it's things, beings are illusory, Buddhas are like a reflection, etc. You've got what's called wisdom and compassion interacting. Okay, check this one out. Bodhisattvas accomplish these tools that Buddhas use to teach called the Ten Powers. Fearlessness courage, self-mastery, and roaring like a lion, they profoundly entered the great ocean of limitless eloquence. They were able to say things that when people heard them, it acted like a key to unlock their lock of insight. After hearing it that way, it's like, oh, that, that's the missing piece in the puzzle. Now I get the picture. They attained being's ocean of words and languages and understood all things. How many languages in the world? Mm. If you come from Kansas City, Missouri, chances are you think, everybody speaks English. Why would I bother with learning anything else? Yes, indeed. So if you grow up in Italy, you need to speak French, Italian, and German just to to do business. They travel in space throughout the Dharma realm without obstruction. Dharmas are unobstructed. We, uh, <laughs> we have a, a, uh, a novice monk at, in the Berkeley Monastery who uh, grew up in Malaysia and uh, he's of an older generation and we asked him the other day, so uh, at home when you're in Malaysia, how many languages do you need to speak on any given day? He said, well, of course, English, he said. But then Mandarin, when I go to work, I have to speak Goyu, Putonghua. And then because my mother is from the north, from Penang, so we speak uh, Hokkien. And uh, let's see, because I was educated, I have to speak Bahasa Malaysia. That's four and then uh, sometimes Cantonese, if we do business, anybody from, from Hong Kong, Cantonese. And uh, let's see, also, did I, what did I leave out, Sam? Uh, Hakka, Hakka. We have to speak Hakka because Kujaren. So six, six languages doing business in Malaysia, right? And if you're a certain generation from Vietnam, chances are you, your parents spoke French because they the best schools were still French until they weren't. And then they also spoke Vietnamese, a couple of dialects. If they come from the north, they have a different accent. If they come from Hue, they speak central, Chap central Vietnamese. They're from, Hano from uh, Ho Chi Minh City, from 
the south, they speak another dialect, and probably Cantonese to boot. So, yeah, yeah. We Americans tend to be kind of provincial. You know, the whole world speaks English, right? Yeah. Continuing, the bodhisattvas understand, attained all beings' ocean of words and language and understood all dharmas. They know that dharmas are unobstructed. They traveled in space through the dharma realm without obstruction. They were purified regard to the states of bodhisattva psychic powers. With courage and vigor, they vanished and subdued the demon armies. Whoa. What would the movie look like if we watched these bodhisattvas subduing demons? Yeah. Constantly using wisdom, they understood the past, the present, and the future. We have to finish in one more page, but I wanted to uh, change the pace a little bit. Here's Samantabhadra. Moving forward, here he is. This actually, that's Manjushri, because that's his lion. This is his companion. And I might add, right behind me here, the Buddha in the center is Vairochana Buddha. He's the Buddha right behind here. To one side is Samantabhadra. To the other side is Manjushri. This is the Avatamsaka Trinity. Here is Manjushri. Teams up with Vairochana and Manjushri. So for a Bodhisattva who is unknown, look at who Samantabhadra is in the Mahayana. He is the host of the Avatamsaka. He speaks on behalf of the Buddha in, in this chapter. There he is, that's Vairochana. Samantabhadra teaches the Avatamsaka. What else? He is the master of Samadhi. He is the best meditator. If you want to enter Samadhi and have this experience of body and mind sinking, operating at a level like never before, kind of like a, like an octave, right? Here we go. Here's a note. Here's the octave. Same string, two notes. Here we go. That's an octave. When we can really master meditation, the same body can operate in a different octave. That's samadhi. You can see and know things that ordinarily you couldn't. What else? Here's Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. He is the confessor in, in the Avatamsaka, in our sutra. Samantabhadra Bodhisattva is the one you go to when you want to wash clean, when you want to cleanse your soul and start over. How... Uh, how painful that is and how it feels so good <laughs> to unburden, to share and let it go. Samantabhadra says, uh-huh, you are sincere, start again. Try again, try your best. Master Hua would do that. Inspires you to greater effort. What else? He had another job. He was called the Bodhisattva Great Practices. His 10 practices and vows completely produced all these bodhisattvas who show up. Furthermore, he is a, a true Kalyanamitra, a good and wise spiritual friend. There's a, a chapter at the end of the Lotus Sutra where uh, it says, let's say you decide you want to memorize a text, you want to put a sutra inside your heart, memorize it. If you can do 49%, but you forget parts of it, Samantabhadra will invisibly come up 
and whisper in your ear, <laughs> tell you the part you forgot. That's what it says. And by golly, if you've ever tried to memorize a text, having him on your side really helps. It works. Samantabhadra Bodhisattva. So, yeah. He, he has a mountain dedicated to him in Sichuan, Mount Ume. Uh, Master Hua, Shifu said that uh, he, his monastery in America is in Seattle, Gold Summit, that Samantabhadra moved. Here's his elephant, Aravana. Incredible. What you're looking at is a, uh, an image that's like 10 times life size in uh, Sichuan province on Umeishan in a place called Wanyansu, 10,000 year monastery. That's an amazing, it's a round monastery, uh, a hall that is built for this image. People are about halfway up his trunk. It's a massive, beautiful white elephant with six tusks. Here he is again. This is a Japanese painting. That's the top half. Here's the bottom half of this painting. I found this painting in the library at, at UC Berkeley and asked the uh, librarian to make a, a life-size copy paid for the reprinting. This was in their archives. Incredible spiritual image, Samantabhadra. There he is. That's the canopy over his head. Yeah, so here he is, Samantabhadra. Nobody knows. You have to be part of our tradition to hear about Samantabhadra. Okay, we got one more chunk of text we need to get to before we're done today. You will indulge with me. Let's do it. Here we go. Sorry, one more time. There we go. Chan 如是等一切菩萨满世多林皆是如来为神之力 Okay, what did he say? They knew that dharmas are like space. They were without discord or contention and free of grasping and attachment. Although they diligently cultivated vigor, they knew that omniscience ultimately does not come from anywhere. Although they contemplated all states, they knew that nothing in existence could be grasped. With expedient wisdom, they entered the entire Dharma realm. With impartial wisdom, they entered all countries. With the power of self-mastery, they caused worlds to revolve and mutually interpenetrate. They were born in all places throughout every world. They saw the different shapes and forms in all worlds. From a subtle and tiny state, they manifested a vast, great kshetra. From a vast and great state, they manifested a subtle, tiny kshetra. At the dwelling of one Buddha with a single thought, they obtained the aid of the Buddha's awesome spirit, universally viewing the ten directions, free from any delusion, and within one instant, they could travel anywhere. Aided by the thus come one's sublime spiritual powers, all those bodhisattvas completely filled the Jada Grove. Yes. So, look at these qualities. This is more describing these bodhisattvas. They knew that dharmas are like space, that is to say, um, okay, 
science, what does science say? What is a dharma? A dharma could be my thermos. Here's a dharma. Let's see here. You can, you can make it sing. Here we go. That's my thermos. This is like space. Not only when it's empty, even when it's full of tea, it's still like space. How can that be? If you, you remember from, was it chemistry? I guess it was high school chemistry class where the teacher showed an atom and said, gave us the model of an atom, let's say an atom of hydrogen. I'm just woofing here, I'm not a scientist. But she said, here's a hydrogen atom. It's got a nucleus, it's got protons, it's got electrons, okay, you remember? And if it was one of those models from a kit, the, there's a nucleus that has an atomic weight and that makes hydrogen hydrogen and not oxygen. So a hydrogen nucleus. Protons are, I don't know what protons are. I'm gonna not even try to define them. Electrons s circle. They look like planets going around a sun. And in between, the electrons that are all bound in there with an electrical charge, there's what? Space. In fact, any single atom is mostly emptiness because of its structure, its elements are made up of nucleus, protons, electrons. They're bound by a charge but most of it is air, nothing. And yet when they bond, you know, what does it take to make the metal of my thermos? Those are different atoms of different molecules bonding together in a creative, clever way to become this metal tube that I can fill with hot tea or cold water and it keeps its temperature. It's a functional thermos, how nice. Dharmas are like space. Hmm, interesting. The Buddha's wisdom comes out with these comments that science later goes, oh, you know, our research says, yup, that way. That's how it is. How did the Buddha know that 2,500 years ago? So, the bodhisattvas didn't fight. They weren't attached. They didn't grasp. So there's no need to fight with the bodhisattva from the southwest, if you're in the northeast. Even though they diligently cultivated, they knew that wisdom, when it arises, doesn't come from anywhere because it's inherent, but it's covered. That's our theory, that's kind of our theory of cultivation, that all of these states are ours by birth, by having this nature, and yet we cover them over with what? Grasping and attachment with emotion, with ignorance. Cultivation is the process of removing that so that omniscience is revealed. Contemplating all states, they knew that they couldn't grab them. They see them, you look at them, you don't grab them. They entered the Dharma realm with wisdom. They entered all countries. They caused worlds to revolve and interpenetrate. They were born everywhere, they could bilocate. They saw different shapes and forms. They manifested from small to great. They, manif they reduced from great to small. When there was one Buddha with a single thought, they got the Buddha's help. They could see all directions free from delusion and go anywhere. <laughs> Does this sound like an Oscar winning movie? Everything all at once, everywhere? Everything everywhere all at once? Aided by the Buddha's powers, they filled the jade grove. Whew. Okay, that's our description of the bodhisattvas from the Avatamsaka Sutra. Man, oh man. We've just had a, a list showing us what bodhisattvas are like. They've come, they're gonna wait to hear the Buddha. But, now, this is really interesting, and I'm gonna close our sutra now. Because what's coming up next, for the next, like, I added, I counted up, I think it's the next nine pages of sutra text. The sutra says, 
how bodhisattvas are different from who. Next in our sutra, the camera switches to the other attendees at the Buddha's lecture, and it's very critical of them. They're called two vehicle cultivators. It's Shravakas, voice hearers, and Pracheka Buddhas. And it goes on and on. This is, this is really one of the funny kind of anomalies of our text here. That the sutra spends a lot of time saying who's, and it names them, it names the arhats. Subhuti, Shariputra, Gandahastin, Kalodayin, all these different bodhisattvas who show up also in the Amitabha Sutra that we recite at night. It says they are unable to see any of the stuff we've just been reading today. It doesn't occur to them. They don't see it. They're there. They can't see it. It's as if they were blind. And it goes on at great length describing how the arhat disciples of the Buddha didn't get it. How come? Why does it do this? Uh, we'll go into it next week. Think about this. It's kind of a polemic. It's kind of a criti critical uh, view uh, within the Buddhist world. Definitely criticizing people who use their minds selfishly. They have accomplishment, but they're not up to the selflessness of bodhisattvas. And we'll, we'll go into it next week. It's really, it's fascinating to, to see that the sutra is uh, drawing a line between different levels of perception. So we'll, I'll tell you about that. We, we had a, there was a, a new realization just yesterday. Uh, I'm, I'm lecturing on another text on Saturday mornings here in the Gold Coast. It's Friday afternoon in California. Um, and it's very, very early in China and Taiwan and Hong Kong. It's 4 a.m. Ah! With daylight savings and all. So it's 6 a.m. here in Queensland. I'm explaining a text called the Zheng Dao Ge Song of Awakening. Song of Enlightenment. And we realize that for the last, since it's, it's, it's a song, 63 verses. <laughs> Who's ready for 63 verse long song? Start singing it now and you'll be done in two hours. Maybe. From verse 44, we're now at 53. Master uh, Shrinji, the monk who's singing it, who wrote it, starts getting critical. Likewise. And he's really going through all these different ways to miss the point or to pretend that you understand when you don't. And as I was preparing for the, the lecture, I realized that we first meet him when he has an interview with the sixth patriarch, Master Hui Nong. That's how this monk first kind of comes on the radar. Is he goes, he's already been meditating to success. He's enlightened. He's seen his mind. This is uh, Master Shenzhi. And in the Chinese tradition, if you wake up, you have to have, you don't, can't say you're enlightened. You have to have somebody certify you. And of course, in this process, there's all kinds of phonies and pretenders and people who are out to have all of the advantages of being enlightened without actually having done the work. And how do you know? How can you prove it? You're enlightened, prove it. So that's the issue, because enlightenment is invisible. Nobody knows what's going on in somebody else's mind. So the question of who's really awake is a big question, in not just in the Buddhist world, but in religious communities worldwide. So. Master Shrenjri travels to where the Sixth Patriarch is and has this dialogue with him that we've loved ever since it first was 
recorded and because these two guys are having at each other in what's called Zen combat. And it's fascinating to see how they challenge each other not to set up anywhere, not to attach. And we're not going to go over it today, but as I said yesterday when I was preparing my talk, I was reminded that our first encounter with Master Shrinjaya was in fact one of those times when somebody is being challenged to see the level of their awakening. And Master Shrinjaya goes, after he gets certified by the Sixth Patriarch, goes back to Yongjia, where he was, far in the north. And he comes up with this 63-verse song and spends a lot of time in the song talking about people who are uh, phony, who pretend to be enlightened but aren't. And a lot of time. Verse 44 is where he begins, and we're now at 53, and he's still going. So that was kind of interesting. And now today, or starting next week, that is, the Avatamsaka is going to be critical of these other monks uh, who are not at the level of the Bodhisattva. So, interesting. We'll get there. My body's not a graveyard for the flesh of living things, not complicit in the slaughter of the stockyard. May I spice my food with generosity. May my table be a blessing for the world. And the beings with fins say thank you. Beings with feathers say thank you. Beings with fur say thank you, thank you for the gift of life. Let's heal our broken hearts with everybody. Till I extend my compassion to every being, I myself will not find peace of mind. Teaching a child not to step on a snail Saves the snail and also saves the child. Don't ask, can they reason, but can they feel pain? In suffering, we and they are one. I call animals my neighbors and my friends. With kindness, our broken world can mend. And the beings that fly say, thank you, beings that swim say beings that crawl say thank you thank you for the gift of life let's heal our broken land with everybody famous quote if factory farms had walls made of glass the whole world would be vegetarian slaughterhouses comes battlefields we order steak go to war again when I don't eat your brother my life extends when you don't kill my neighbor we discover who we are kin for our peace check your dinner plate the same blood runs underneath our skin and the footless being say thank you four-footed beings say thank you many-footed beings say thank you thank you for the gift of life let's heal our broken world with everybody so to what end like why bother with that? Well, how did COVID start? You know, in America,
that we are now officially tribal. We're so polarized that there's no bridge left between one tribe and the other tribe. There's one group that says, oh, it was the Chinese laboratory in Hunan. Just something escaped. The Chinese made it. Because why? That scores political points against Dr. Fauci, who they don't like. And the now the largest scientific research body in the world says, nope, it wasn't a laboratory leak. You know what it was? It was a wet market where people ate something called a raccoon dog. Uh, what is it in Chinese? Somebody knows. It's, uh, it's, I've seen the pictures of it. It looks like a furry, fuzzy, large raccoon. People ate it, and somehow it crossed the species barrier, and COVID began. Meat eating. Not just only meat eating, but, my God, it was more like adventure eating. Let's eat something different, something kind of gamey and racy and special. So they go to the wet market where cages are stacked on top of each other and feces drop from the top on filtering down and animals get very, very sick and then we eat them to have a little different flavor and get very, very sick. So who was it? Uh, David Attenborough, Sir, Sir David, said last week that of the biomass of mammals, if you take all the mammals and add them up, it's called a hao, raccoon dog. It's called a hao. There it is. Okay, a hao. That's the name of the... Yeah, there we go. So, uh, Sir David said, if you take all the mammals, and here in Australia we got lots of them, Take all the mammals and weigh them. Humans are 96%. Everything else is 4%. So we humans are this monstrous species that has gobbled up everything else. And we, a huge, huge, huge portion of that biomass is the world that we've created to feed ourselves. The things that we eat. The cows and the chickens and the pigs and the geese and the fish. And of all the bird species in the world, 70% of the birds in the world are poultry, chickens, that we raise for food. So three out of ten or any other bird. My goodness, why do we overlook this? If you look at uh, well, yeah. One of the best parts of being a human is the amount of choice that we have and how we choose to nourish our bodies can have a lot to do with how long we're still able to live on the planet. Uh, as a monk, we, our foods are pretty limited, uh, and yet we thrive. You think, my teacher's teacher lived to be 120 and never ate a Big Mac, or a Whopper, an Impossible Burger, probably would have tried it. So, yeah, but we want our kids to get into Stanford. We want our kids to get into MIT or Oxford or 
University of UQ, University of Queensland. So we feel we ought to feed them meat so they can be competitive. Well, it could be the opposite. Maybe if you fed them less meat, they might even test better and make it onto the basketball varsity. You never know. Alrighty, so I'll stop pounding that drum for now. Thank you for the gift of life. That's a great practice, is just to say, golden rule, I love to live, every other creature does too, so by not eating them, I'm gonna grant them gift of at least they won't be part of my, I will give them a place at the table, but not on the table as food. I'll give them a chair and make sure they're fit. And I wanna say this morning, I had nine turkeys under my feet today. They were gobbling up the bird seed. It's going to be cold here. And everybody, all the birds are like eating three times as much. They were all these, usually the turkeys when they come in for breakfast in the morning, there's one or two who spend all their effort chasing the others out. They want to dominate the space. Today, I guess because of the change of season, they all were busy eating. Nobody was being a bully today. They were all too busy. The corn, they like the corn the best. So, yeah, seasonal change. Everybody wants to bulk up, add some, some fat and some warmth. So, double rations until the weather stabilizes. So. All righty, uh, let's see. I've got something to share before we invite the monks of the monastery to tell us what's going on. This is a story from Good Karma Music. This is Michael in... Uh, Santa Clara, he says, I'm more of an introvert, so I know how it feels to be with a group of people, yet at the same time feel excluded or left out. At work, we usually have team lunches once a week. Once I went with some of my fellow co-workers and I saw somebody else standing alone away from the group. I approached him, we chatted over lunch. He got to know me, my co-workers better. Since I've done this several times, I've noticed our team has become more lively. More people have been showing up at the office. Work is still fully remote, so coming to the office is optional. Not sure if it's improved team productivity, but creating a friendly work atmosphere is definitely something I feel proud and happy about. So if we go to dharmaradio.org, let me type that right in here, dharmaradio.org, Go out there. What you'll find is something called, oh, it's all in Chinese at the moment. Can we go back to English? There we go. It's got bilingual website. There we are. See Good Karma Music right here? There it is right there, Good Karma Music. If you click on that and go out and do a good deed, however you define it, whatever you would like to do, like inviting a lonely uh, friend to have lunch, Share it with us, what you did, in the form right here. Tell us what it was. Fill in the, the blanks. We will send you a MP3 of an album of Buddhist music or stories, The Light That Never Dies, Brian Conroy's stories, or Spirit in the Cave of the Heart, Father Cyprian Concilio, a Benedictine monk who is a wonderful songwriter, guitarist, and singer, uh, or Paramita, American Buddhist folk songs, stories for awakening, or Dharma radio itself. Then, furthermore, you get to read the stories that come in. Bao from Singapore, I try my best to help sick, sick people by listening to their struggle. Good deed, send him music. The choir from KL, I listen to music to relax. Indeed, well done. Jay from Jacksonville. One time I let a friend live with me for a bit while they were trying to get back on their feet. Kind of extreme. Otherwise, as usual, friend stuff. Listening to them vent about the problems. Usually relationships are helping with small emergencies. A skillful listener. Good deed indeed. Share that music. Good karma. All right. Let's see here. Is... Uh, Jin Chuan or Jin Wei online to tell us what's happening at the Berkeley Monastery? Yes, Amitofo. Amitofo, hey, we're here. Hey, both there. It's great. What's going on? Well, we have an upcoming retreat if you go to the Berkeley Monastery website. Mindfulness to Heartfulness at Sunna Center, June 3rd to 10th. 
Dharma Master Chu, Doug Powers, and we just heard Dr. Martin Verhoeven will all be joining. So very rare opportunity yeah. that three senior disciples of Master Hua all together for seven days. I'm not, I don't know if they'll be there. I think they're taking different days. Yeah. Um, but they'll be actually coming in person, which is really nice. So that's a Suna Center. And I think you have to sign up sooner rather than later because I think the spaces are limited. Um, I think you'll see below Marty's lectures have started up again. And also I mentioned uh, uh, tomorrow, Reverend Shur has a lecture in the City of 10,000 Buddhas live uh, YouTube channel is the Avatamsaka Sutra in chapter 25. Then really? transference. Yeah, Zoom link is here. And also it's in YouTube uh, link as well. You okay. can go to the good. CTV yep. website. Will do. What about the daily ceremonies? What's going on? That's, oh, um, so it's restarted. So we will stop for January 25th, but we will actually having to take another break starting April 7th because we have other activities at the monastery. Okay. So right now the ceremonies are happening as, as regularly scheduled, morning and evening, in our 1230 afternoon recitation. Those who didn't try it, the last week, we'll stream them and... Uh, uh, it will be available recordings for the period when we will not stream so people can still follow up. Alrighty. Sounds good. I think There's one more thing. Classes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Thursday, Fridays, we have our regular days of meditation that are open. Um, but also mentioned Buddha Roof Farm. I'm not sure if the actual form is online yet. Um, okay. They're putting it together. But if you type buddharooffarm.org, Dharma Master, Okay. On the on the top rootfarm.org. Rootfarm.org. Yeah. You'll see that there is some details there. And to get information, please just type your email there and then you will be notified uh with when the application will be um kind of uh available. Mm -hmm. So that will be I think probably in the next couple of weeks that will be the information will be sent out. But there's a kind of a yeah a, a kind of a sense of what could be happening this upcoming and Guru farm and it will be a recitation session where we say the guani name kind of returning to the spirit of the first buddha Root farm when it was the uh, amitala's yeah. recitation session so definitely very recommended to, to to you can also watch some videos to give you a flavor for those people who never have a chance yes. to, to see yeah the nature and the different activities what we have there is a very rich experience indeed all right thank you so much for that and yeah buddhrut farm up in the the uh, coastal mountains of oregon it's this very special retreat uh cultivating the way in nature is like nothing else okay thank you so much Let's do our dedication of merit now and invite everybody to make a wish and send out your goodness wherever you would care to share to whomever you would like to dedicate it. When we do it together, it really gets some strength. the 
this boundless light Dispel the darkness of our endless night Because our hearts are one This world of pain turns into paradise May all become compassionate and wise May all become compassionate and wise May all become compassionate and wise We can conclude by bowing to the Buddha. You're welcome to bow right from where you're sitting if you care to. to the Venerable Master. Okay, that's going to do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week. Omni 12-4. Bye now.